Have you ever taken any history of science courses before? Anything related to philosophy of science? What normally happens in those courses, when they teach you 17th century, most of the time they focus not on the Aristotelian worldview, but they focus on a whole bunch of different philosophical views and theories that were available on the market. So they talk about Galileo, they talk about Boyle, they talk about Gassendi, they talk about many, many different directions which were pursued in that century. But what's interesting from our standpoint is that none of those views was actually accepted. The accepted theory all the way until the end of the century remained the good old Aristotelian medieval worldview. Why did it remain accepted until the end of the century? What was wrong with those suggestions? By the second law, we know this, that if something doesn't become accepted, there's only one reason for that, because it didn't satisfy the requirements of the time. Cartesian natural philosophy and the theories that came with it became accepted only towards the end of the century, and the chief author of that system, Descartes, he realized that the only way you can convince the community is not by making experiments. That's not going to help you actually satisfying the requirements of that community. Now Descartes realized that in order to convince the community, he has to show that his theory is intuitively true. So how do you do that? Let's have a look. This worldview was accepted for a very short period of time, actually for about 40 years, and primarily, if not only, on the continent. It was accepted for a very short period of time in Cambridge in England, but other than that, it was mostly accepted on the continent, France, Netherlands, Sweden. In the center of this mosaic, you have a Cartesian natural philosophy and physics. So you have optics, you have mechanistic physiology, geology, the study of Earth, cosmology, all mechanistic. Theology is still part of the mosaic. Metaphysics, I'm going to explain that. <laughs> Mathematics, you see Cartesian space. Mechanistic biology, and finally, we see here, hypothetical deductive method. Let's start with the metaphysics. Here he is, carrying a sword. One Swedish princess, who was very fond of Descartes' teaching, invited Descartes to Sweden to teach her philosophy and science and all sorts of things. But the peculiar thing about her schedule was that she was so busy that she could only study at 5 a.m. in the morning. So Descartes had to wake up at, what, 4 in the morning? He, he didn't survive. He didn't survive two months there. He just died. Anyways, <laughs> this is what Descartes says. We have the external world, we have the mind, we have things as they exist in reality, and we have our experiences of things, and this here would be my theories about things. Now, Descartes says, if you want to convince someone that what you say is intuitively true, the first thing you need to do, you have to erase, delete, Remove, reject everything you thought you knew. Everything. You have to make sure that you only accept what is true. And in order to do that, you start by doubting everything. So essentially, we're looking for a clean sheet. Okay, we are erasing all the knowledge. First thing, we erase all our theories. And then, I doubt my experience. I doubt the existence of the external world. And even my own existence. I have to start by doubting everything. Otherwise, how do I know if what I accept is actually the case? I might be accepting something without necessary foundation. So let's erase everything and only accept those things which are true. Let's see where he goes with this. We erased everything, everything is clean. And then he says, but when I doubt everything, one thing becomes certain immediately. What is it? It's the fact that I doubt. Can we all agree on that? You cannot doubt without doubting. It would be very difficult to do. But the moment you realize you doubt, you also understand that you think, because doubting is just a way of thinking, isn't it? It's just one way of thinking. I doubt, therefore I think. But in order to be able to doubt and think, shouldn't I at least exist? It would be very inconvenient to do the thinking without existing, if not impossible. So it follows that I exist. Now, this proves that my mind exists, that thing that does the thinking. But it doesn't really say anything about my body or the external world, right? 
this might be an illusion, we don't know at this stage, and we decided to doubt everything. So what do you do? He says, after I've proved my own existence, it becomes obvious to me that God, the ultimately perfect being, also exists. You say, well, how can you ever prove anything like this? Sorry to disappoint you, I'm not going to give you the answer. I'm not going to give you the answer because the answer is going to be your DIY assignment for this week's tutorial. It's a very peculiar argument how on earth you can arrive from something like I exist to God exists. That's exactly what Descartes does. At this point, I want you to accept for the sake of argument that he has proven this. But why would anyone bother proving that God exists? Why would he need this? There's an old saying which says that it had never occurred to anyone to doubt the existence of God until the likes of Descartes undertook to prove it. <laughs> so why would he bother? You see, he needs God to prove the existence of the external world. Without God, he cannot prove this. And this argument is very interesting. He says this, he is, God here, is a supremely perfect being. As a supremely perfect being, he is all good. He is what we call benevolent, meaning that he doesn't do any evil. As a supremely perfect being, because if he did something bad, he wouldn't be perfect, he would be malicious. Therefore, a perfect being is all good by definition. Everyone agrees? So the moment that you accept the existence of this being, you also have to accept that he is all good, because this is what's implicit in the definition of this being. The moment you accept this, you also realize that everything that you perceive clearly and distinctly must be true. Why is that? Because if it so happened that what I perceive clearly and distinctly is not really true, it would mean that God is a demon, that he's a deceiver. But we know that he is all good. Therefore, he couldn't have possibly allowed such a huge deception to take place. Therefore, he says, the moment that you realize that a certain idea is very clear and very distinct, you can be absolutely sure that is true. Let's see where he goes with this. He says, I perceive clearly and distinctly that my sensations are caused by external objects. Now, when you sense something, there are several options here. The one option is that the source of your sensations is your own mind. But this clearly cannot be the case because if I'm the source of my perceptions, it means that I can control them. But I certainly cannot control my perceptions, can I? It's not really up to me to decide whether I perceive a red apple or a green apple or a blue apple. I do not control these things. Therefore, I'm not the source of my perceptions. You follow it? Therefore, the source of my perceptions should be something external. And this is how I come to appreciate that I perceive clearly and distinctly that it is the external world that affects my sensations. At this stage, I don't know whether my sensations match the world. It may be something completely different out there. But one thing I know at this stage for sure is that the source of perceptions is from the outside. And since you perceive clearly and distinctly that your sensations are caused by external objects, Therefore, this cannot merely be products of your imagination, or otherwise God would be deceiving you, which is impossible because he is not a deceiver. And therefore, the material world exists independently of my mind. Let's recap the argument to see the logical connections. Now, it starts from this, the idea of God's benevolence. God is a supremely perfect being. God is all good. This follows from the definition of God. It follows from this that clear, distinct ideas are true. Everything that I perceive clearly and distinctly is, in fact, true. On the other hand, I perceive very clearly that the mind-independent material world actually exists. You have a clear and distinct perception of the existence of the external world, and you have a guarantee given by the Creator Himself that whatever you perceive clearly and distinctly must actually be the case. You put these two together, and you arrive at the conclusion that matter the external mind independent material world actually exists. What do you think about the argument? Hi, my name is Liu Manggo. My question is that is there any similarity between the statement that clear ideas are true uh, and the Aristotelian medieval method that uh, what is true is 
intuitive uh, truth? Yes. That's a very good point. Descartes, he knew the rules of a game. He knew that the only way to convince the community is by showing that your theories are intuitively true. And when he was devising his own method, he put everything in such a way so that the Aristotelian community be convinced. That was his major target. So this clear and distinct ideas is nothing else but a way to satisfy the requirements of the Aristotelian community. This is what you're looking for. You're looking for intuitive truth. I'm going to give you one that is beyond any question. So I'm going to be more Aristotelian than Aristotle himself. That's basically the idea. And he succeeded. He succeeded. He showed that his theory is more intuitively true than Aristotle's theory itself. Let's see how. This is the proof of the existence of the external world. Now, you have two substances here. You have the human mind and you have the material world. Now, the question is, what are the indispensable properties, essential properties of mind and essential properties of matter? Now, what are the properties without which you cannot possibly conceive mind? Is there a quality which, if you take away from mind, is no longer mind? The quality that every mind should necessarily have, otherwise it's not really mind. It's the capacity of thinking. You cannot possibly conceive of a mind that is not capable of thinking. And if you have come across one, it's not much of a mind. Mind is thought. The principal attribute of mind is thought. And by principal attribute, he means essential, indispensable property, a property that you cannot take away from that substance. What about the indispensable properties of matter? We've covered this. There's a capacity to occupy space. It can be a fuzzy shape, it can be some fixed shape, but some extension is required. You cannot be material if you don't have extension. They are so different here, but they all have one thing in common, is their capacity to occupy space. Therefore, matter is extension. The principal attribute of matter is extension. If you ask Descartes, he would say, these propositions, these statements, are intuitively true. We have arrived at them without making any experiments. You just think of these things, and these things become obvious. Whether they are or aren't is a different issue, but we can all appreciate one thing, that this appears, at least appears, very intuitive indeed, doesn't it? I'm going to zoom out. Several interesting consequences follow from this. The first one is the idea of dualism, the idea that there are two substances. I'm going to explain this in detail, one by one. The next one is the idea of mechanicism, the idea that material objects are composed of bits of interacting matter. And finally, if you ask the question, how can two bits of matter affect each other? You arrive at the idea of action by contact, that everything happens only by contact. Now, let's start with mechanicism. This is the idea that material objects are composed of bits of interacting matter. This is essentially the idea. And as such, it came to replace the Aristotelian idea of hylomorphism. This is the one I'm going to explain. In the Aristotelian worldview, this was accepted. This is the idea that every compound, everything essentially, can be decomposed into its form and matter. Let's take Aristotle and a typical compound, a human being, Socrates in this case. If you analyze his body, you can say that it is a compound of the four bodily fluids, right? The four humors. But this is not the whole story, says Aristotle. If you only have the four bodily fluids, is this enough to make a human being? Not really. What's missing is the soul, which makes a living thing alive, which organizes the fluids in such a way that they produce a working human organism. This is the idea. This is the matter of the body, the four fluids, and this is the form of the body. And everything in the universe is a combination of matter and form, except for the God. But this is a different story. If you look now at each of the fluids, let's take blood, for instance. It's the same story. In this case, blood is a compound of the four elements, predominantly element air, but also some other elements, right? There's some water, some mixture of other elements. But this is not enough. You also need the form of bloodness, the organizing principle that makes a thing what it is. 
And the same applies to the elements. If you take the element air, it's the same picture. It's also composed of matter and form. You zoom in here, you get some primary matter. We don't really know what that matter is, but it must be composed of some sort of matter. But this is not enough. It has to have an organizing principle. In this case, the substantial form of airness imposed on it. So this was the idea, hylomorphism. Hyle is Greek for matter, and morphe is Greek for form. We have morphology in linguistics, right? Study of forms. So hylomorphism is the idea that every compound can be analytically decomposed. It doesn't mean that you can have a separate form and separate matter. You can never have that. It's impossible to have matter without form, according to Aristotle. So you can only analytically decompose. Every compound can be analytically decomposed into its form and matter. If you ask Descartes, he would say this is complete and utter nonsense. Why is this nonsense? Because, you see, this talk of forms is extremely occult. It gives the impression of explanation, but it doesn't explain anything. In reality, he says, the moment you realize that the only attribute of matter is extension, there are no such things as forms. The only thing that we deal with is bits of matter interacting with each other. Therefore, we realize that these forms are utterly fictitious. So they must go. And in reality, what you have is the body here is essentially a complex hydraulic machine. Think of it as a machine, says Descartes. that operates purely mechanistically. So if you zoom in at a specific organ, in this case, the eyes, each organ, he says, is nothing but a system of valves, pulleys, pipes, and pumps. And essentially, every effect in the body is produced by the collision of moving particles that compose the body. This is your purely mechanistic picture. Think of it as a clockwork universe, a universe in which everything is just a machine. It's a very complex machine, but it's just a machine. There is nothing more. There are no organizing forms. There are no organizing principles or whatever. It's just a combination and collision of tiny bits of matter. Now, this is the idea of action by contact. An action by contact came to replace the Aristotelian idea of a final cause. We have to start from Aristotle again. If you ask the Aristotelians, they'd say the universe is full of goals, full of purposes. Everything that exists, exists for a certain goal, certain end, certain purpose. It's not a meaningless universe. Everything that exists has a certain goal. If you take, let's say, the reproduction of animals, why do animals reproduce? The answer is they reproduce because that's their intrinsic goal. That's their purpose, okay? That's their aim. The aim of animals is to reproduce. Why does an apple tree grow? because growing and bearing apples is the intrinsic goal of the apple tree, dictated by the substantial form. Why does the statue exist? It exists because it serves a certain purpose. What's the purpose? It's not intrinsic. This time it's extrinsic. It's something external. For the sake of beauty, that's why it exists. Human beings, what's the purpose of existence of human beings? It must be dictated by our form, by our indispensable quality which is our capacity of thinking. Therefore, the goal of human existence would be to fulfill your capacity of thinking to its fullest, to develop and to exercise your capacity of thinking to the fullest. This would be your Aristotelian purpose of life. Why do we exist? To think and exercise our thinking to its utmost degree. Everything in the world, according to this type of thinking, exists for a certain goal. Now, if you are Descartes, what would you say to this whole worldview. You say it just doesn't make any sense. This talk of goals, aims and purposes doesn't make any sense. If we recall that matter has only one principal attribute and that attribute is extension. There is nothing in extension that says that things must have any goals. Things happen not for a certain goal but because things touch each other, contact each other. Everything happens because of pushes and collisions. So this whole idea of teleology is utter nonsense. A change can only be brought about by actual contact. Thus, here, everything that happens here must have a purely mechanical explanation. It can be a very complex explanation, but essentially it's just a clockwork. A very complex, but it's a clockwork. It's a mechanism.
that you don't need any purposes. How do you explain the workings of a clock? You can say, well, it shows the right time because it was created to do that. Yeah, but it's, this is a sloppy explanation, isn't it? The real mechanistic explanation would be to say, well, according to the laws of mechanics, you have this clock here and this spring attached to it and this lever here and this escapement here, and then they move the whole thing in such a way that it shows the right time. That would be the mechanical explanation. And that's the only type of explanation that Descartes would accept. The same applies to the animal kingdom, to inanimate matter, to the whole universe. If you think of bits of interactive matter, they can only collide with each other and there are no other capacities, no goals. If you accept this view, then you also accept the basic principle of the Cartesian physiology. It's the idea that changes in organisms are caused by collisions of material particles. Like that. If you take the phenomenon of vision, for instance, these are, by the way, actual drawings from Descartes. Light rays here from external object, they impress subtle particles onto the eye. So it's purely mechanistic, you see, train of particles arriving at the eye and pushing. Then the image from the eyes is transmitted to the brain. Again, purely mechanistically, there is no mystery here. It's all like in a clockwork. Similarly, the human heart is just a hydraulic pump that pushes the blood into the arteries. Effectively, all reflexes in the body are produced by the motion of material parts. If you accept this, then you also accept that changes in organisms are explicable in purely physical terms. And here are a few drawings from the same time period. This is, in particular, an attempt to explain flight in uh, geometric terms. Here's another one. And here's another one. The idea was that all sciences, including sciences about animals, zoology in particular, can be geometrical, can be mathematical. Now, dualism, this is the third idea here. What is dualism? Dualism is the belief that there are two independent substances, two types of things that can exist on their own. Extended substance, which we call matter, and thinking substance, which we call mind. This idea came to replace the Aristotelian idea of pluralism, and pluralism is the idea that there are many, many different types of substances, not really reducible to one another. They are very distinct. If you asked Aristotle, he would say, the world is full of different types of things. A thing is characterized by its substantial form, right? It's made of some matter, but it's also characterized by a certain substantial form, the quality that makes it what it is, and the quality that organizes it. Now, what is the substantial form of a mountain? It's the quality of mountainness, if there is such a thing. Substantial quality of an apple tree is its capacity to grow and bear apples. Fair enough. The substantial quality of the lion cub is that it can grow into a mature lion, I think. And finally, a human being is characterized by his capacity of reason. So there are as many substances as there are types of things. Every individual type of thing, like humans, animals, Every individual type of thing is characterized by a certain form that separates it from other things. This two, if you compare a mountain and the apple tree, two different substances for Aristotle, they certainly share some kind of matter that must be made of a similar combination of elements. It must be some earth and some water, probably also some air, maybe. So from the point of view of the elements, they might be very similar, but what makes them very different is the substantial forms, the respective substantial forms. So no matter how you rearrange the matter of the mountain, it will never be capable of bearing fruits. This is the Aristotelian idea. Why is that? Not because they are made of different stuff. Sometimes you have two different things made of similar stuff, but they do different things because they are organized differently. If you ask Descartes, he would say, the Aristotelians multiplied substances without any reason. You don't need thousands and thousands of different substances. You actually don't need them. In reality, there are only two types of things. What are the types of things? These are material things, things that occupy space. All material things are nothing but systems of moving particles. And the only attribute they have is a capacity to occupy space. So all material things are essentially different arrangements of the same extended substance, which is matter. The mind, however, according to Descartes, is a different substance.
The mind is different because it's not made of particles, it's not made of material stuff. It's immaterial. Its primary attribute, thought, cannot be explicated in terms of shape, size, or motion of material particles. Human beings, therefore, are the only creatures in the universe who are citizens of two different worlds. The world of matter and the ideal world, the world of mind. Ideal comes from noun idea, meaning thought. The ideal doesn't mean perfect in this case, it just means having to do with ideas. Okay? Descartes believed there are other creatures who have only minds, but do not have bodies. So what would be those creatures? Any, any ideas? Like angels? Yep, angels and the creator himself. They have minds, but they don't have bodies. On the other hand, there are things that are purely material, and this includes even animals, you see. Animals would be pure mechanisms. Yep, Why didn't he think that animals had minds? Because he believed that there is no capacity of thinking, really, that it's all based on reflexes. And as far as reflexes are concerned, even the human body, as far as its reflexes are concerned, is pure mechanism. Just like he was trying to explain vision. You don't need the capacity of thinking to do any seeing, right, to see things. So similarly, for animals, it's a no, no, they only have sensations, but they don't have any capacity of thinking. In particular, they don't have self-awareness, they cannot create theories, they don't have language. They have only some animal signals and stuff, but there's no capacity of thinking. And as long as there's no capacity of thinking, there's no mind. Because what is it that characterizes mind? It's capacity of thinking, right? In a Cartesian universe, only human beings are citizens of two worlds. Everything else is either pure mind or pure matter. This is your idea of dualism. That there are two substances, the extended substance and the thinking substance, and we are the only creatures that have both. Yeah, Miriam? How can the mind interact with physical matter to change it? The question arises as to how can something that is not extended, something that's just pure mind, affect something that is material? If everything is material, if it's only neurons, you see, it's possible to explain that. Matter affecting another matter. It's all fine. But if one is completely different from another, how can they ever interact? That's the question, right? They couldn't really find an answer to that. There was a whole bunch of different hypotheses. None of them really worked. But it didn't really stop them from appreciating that there are two different types of things. Let's sum it up. We have dualism, we have action by contact, and we have mechanism. So these are some of the fundamental principles of a Cartesian mosaic. Now tell me, which principle of the Aristotelian medieval mosaic dualism came to replace? Pluralism, Pluralism right. Action by contact, it came to replace the idea of teleology, the idea that everything has a goal and things can change because they have a goal, that you know, animals reproduce because it's their goal. In the Cartesian worldview, this sort of an explanation is no longer acceptable. You cannot say it's their goal. You have to explain the mechanism. You see, it really pays off to have lots of former girlfriends. <laughs> so you can tell about all of them without repeating. So this is a completely different one. So uh, <laughs> the discussion came to the point when I was explaining Cartesian worldview. It was that boring, yes. And, uh, and she said, he wasn't very much of a romantic, was he? It doesn't really strike me as, as a romantic. So how, how could you deduce anything like that from this? Like, what's the connection? And she said, in his worldview, everything happens by actual contact, right? It's only, it's only touching and, you know, it's only contact. They say, ah, that's what you mean, okay. <laughs> Mechanicism was the opposite. Hylomorphism, the idea that there are forms and there is matter. This is what we have. Any questions so far? So where does an explanation of gravity fit into this? This is what you mean? <laughs> All right, yeah. <laughs> You see, it's a natural question, and I like you asked it. You can say, all right, I understand. As far as things like a billiard table are concerned, we can explain everything as a result of actual contact. For those things, for mechanical things like clockwork, this makes sense. But what about those phenomena which seemingly involve action at distance? Like when you have a magnet that attracts another bit of, let's say, a magnet or iron or something. What happens there? There doesn't seem to be anything in between. 
and the same applies to gravity. When you let this go, you really believe that there is something in between that does the pushing. So how do you explain gravity by actual contact? You understand that this is an interesting question. So any mechanistic worldview faces this challenge. The moment you say everything in the universe happens just like in a clockwork, then immediately you have to face this question. What about gravity? What about magnetism? Essentially, the phenomena that seemingly imply action of two things at a distance without any actual mediators. Now, we have Cartesian physics and cosmology, two elements we have to focus on here. Matter is extension, and it follows from that that material objects can interact only by actual contact. If the only quality that material things have is the capacity to occupy some space, then how can one extended thing affect another extended thing? It cannot send signals because it doesn't have that capacity. And even if it sends signals, those signals should be material. They should occupy some space. So the only way that two bits of matter can affect each other is by actually touching each other. Now, if you accept this idea, then it follows from that that every part of matter maintains its state unless a collision with another part changes the state. So think of a typical billiard ball. What can happen to it if nothing whatsoever affects that ball? It's going to maintain its state, right? Nothing whatsoever can happen to it. So the only time that it can change its state is when it's affected by something else. So this would be Descartes' first law. And the second law would be that every part of matter, regarded by itself, tends to continue moving only along straight lines. Why straight? Because Descartes has shown that the motion in a straight line and the state of rest are essentially the same thing because there's no acceleration there, right? So if something is moving with a constant velocity in this direction, how can it ever change its velocity? Something should affect it. Otherwise, it's going to maintain its state of motion along a straight line forever. Well, it is true that in our universe it never happens, and there are reasons why. Nothing really moves in straight lines because the world is full of things and they affect each other. But by itself, the tendency is to move along straight lines because that's the most simple of all motions. So these are his laws. Here's a question for you. Can there be absolutely empty space in such a universe? What do you think? By absolutely empty space, we mean space devoid of matter. Space and there's no matter whatsoever. What do you think, Miriam? I don't think there can be because matter, by definition, must take up space. So if there is space there, it must contain matter. You are very close to the actual reason, very close. Now, Descartes says there can be no empty space. You cannot have space without matter. Descartes' explanation is that space is not a separate substance. It's just a property. And what is space? Space, extension, is the attribute of matter. So if miraculously you removed all the material things from the world, you would remove space itself. Space is not something that exists on its own. Space is just that extension. And there is as much space as there are material things. Yes, he did believe that the universe is extended indefinitely, that there are no boundaries. But he also believed that you only have space where you have material things. Space is not a substance. You see, there are only two substances out there. The material substance and the thinking substance. And what is space? It's not a substance. It's an attribute of a substance. It's a property. It's that capacity to occupy space, the extension itself. That's why you cannot have space without matter. It's almost the same as to have redness without anything actually being red. You cannot have just redness floating here. It should be attached to something. You can have a red shirt or red hat or red cup, but you cannot just have, oh, I see red. Red what? Red is a quality, it's an attribute. It has to be attached to a certain substance. Make sense? So think of space as a quality, as an attribute, as a property. It cannot be free floating, it should be attached to something. So. There can be no empty space. 
The name for this is plenism, from Latin plenum, the world is full, plenum. Another name for this is horror vacui, nature abhors a vacuum. What is vacuum? Vacuum is the empty space, right? And since there can never be empty space, according to this worldview, nature does everything possible to prevent a vacuum. Now, we know for a fact that motion exists, things move. The next question for you, how can anything move in a universe that is full of things? He did believe that there is no empty space, so space here is full of tiny particles of air, the cosmic space is filled with tiny particles that occupy the cosmic space, it might be visible or invisible, that's a different issue, but it's all full of particles, right? So how can anything possibly move in a space that is full? If the space were empty, if this is empty, then I step here, this is no longer empty, this is empty. But what happens if this is full? How can anything move? Despite the fact that every bit of matter taken by itself tends to move along the straight lines, in reality, since the world is full of things, the actual motion is always circular, always involves some sort of a displacement. It can be an immediate displacement like that, or it could be, I'm stepping here, this goes here, that goes there, that goes there, and this comes here. So it can be a huge circle, but there must be some sort of a circular displacement. Circularity of motion. All motion is circular. It is an interchange of positions. Remember this. Now let's try to explain gravity. How would you explain gravity in this universe? Let's take the sun. The sun rotates around its own axis. This rotation, says Descartes, creates a vortex of particles around the sun, just like in a whirlpool, okay? Gradually, he says, the matter within the solar vortex forms itself into a set of stratified bands, each lodging a planet. Some of the planets also rotate around their own axis, and these individual rotations create smaller vortices, like here we have the terrestrial vortex, and here we have the vortex of Jupiter. So it's all one whirlpool within another whirlpool within another whirlpool. It's all whirlpools. Let's zoom in here, in this region. The Earth, the Moon. The Earth's rotation creates a vortex of particles around the Earth. The Moon here revolves around the Earth because it is in the Earth's vortex. Not because there is any sort of gravity, there's no such thing. It just revolves because it's being carried by the Earth's vortex. Now, since the Earth rotates around its axis, there is a centrifugal force that draws all terrestrial matter away from the rotating Earth. This is easy to understand. Let's say you're on a carousel. What's the natural tendency? It's away from the center. Why is that? Because every object has a natural tendency to move along straight lines. And when you are being revolved in a circle, your natural tendency is not to revolve in a circle, but to go away from the center of the rotation. It's basic mechanics here. What would happen if the space beyond the Earth's vortex were empty? You have a natural centrifugal force because of this rotation. What would happen if the space beyond the vortex were empty? If there's, there's emptiness there. Can you guess what would happen? Hey, Merka? The moon would just fly off. Yeah, and not just the moon, everything. Yeah. If the space beyond the Earth's vortex were empty, all terrestrial matter and everything within the terrestrial vortex would soon disperse. But it doesn't. It doesn't. Because the outer space here is not empty, you see, is in fact is full of particles revolving in the solar vortex. We are part of a greater vortex, right? So the space is never empty. This results in a very interesting effect. As a result, you see, the finer particles, those of gases, condense at the periphery of the terrestrial vortex because there's no more space to go. They condense there. So think of this little terrestrial vortex as a pot. When you make yourself oatmeal, have you ever tried it? It's actually very good for you. So the first thing you do, you fill it with water and then you put some salt in it. It melts fairly quickly. But before it does, when you mix it, have you noticed what happens? It gathers in the center, just before it melts. The particles of salt gather in the center. Why would they do that? There's a centrifugal force, right? They have to gather towards the periphery. But they gather in the center. Why does that happen? There is an explanation for that. And that explanation is those particles that are smaller and swifter, they gather towards the periphery. 
but since the space is limited, they create an inward pressure here, you see, that pushes more rough bits of matter, those are solid objects, towards the center of the vortex. Think of it this way, let's say you have a rough bit of matter and a swifter one and even a swifter one. And every one of these three have a natural tendency to go towards the periphery. That's what the centrifugal force forces them to do. But there is only that much space that only one of them can be there. So what happens to the other ones? There is no more space and we are pushed back to the center. This is what happens. This here creates an inward pressure. And this inward pressure, says Descartes, is gravity. This brings us to the Cartesian concept of gravity. Gravity, says Descartes, is the inward pressure caused by the condensation of finer matter at the periphery of a vortex. A similar mechanism applies to the solar system and a similar mechanism applies to any vortex. Brilliant, isn't it? It's obviously false, but brilliant. Questions? Yeah. I'm Bryn Moore. If that were the case, why would the moon be on the outside rather than like near the Earth? Descartes' explanation is very straightforward because it's in a state of an equilibrium. It's already there. Once you're there, you have two tendencies. One is the inward pressure that has to supposedly push you towards the Earth. And the other one, you have a natural tendency to go along a straight line. And in the case of the moon and in the case of all the satellites, all the planets, and all the smaller planets revolving around the planet, you have an equilibrium. You have a balance of two forces. Make sense? Can you appreciate the beauty of this? In my opinion, this is one of the most brilliant ideas in the history of science. False, but brilliant. They don't have anything to do with each other. Most of the ideas that we accept these days are going to be considered not as true as the ones of the future. We understand that. And yet, even in 500 years from now, we must be in a position to appreciate the beauty of Einstein's theory, just like we appreciate the beauty of Descartes' theory. Isn't it beautiful? Ingenious explanation of something that seemingly cannot possibly have a mechanistic explanation. And here, he gave a mechanistic explanation. So the mechanistic conception of gravity allowed to explain a whole bunch of phenomena, terrestrial and celestial. In particular, it allowed to explain the revolution of planets around their suns and satellites around their planets. Here you see different vortices. This would be the solar vortex, this would be another vortex of another star. It also allowed to explain the motion of the moon in the Earth's vortex and the tides. Tides were explained in a mechanistic fashion. Also the transition of comets from one vortex to another vortex. You see this light blue line here? It's a path of a comet. So back then they believed that comets pass from vortex to vortex. Essentially they are wanderers from one vortex to another vortex. They didn't think that they're coming back. Now, what about magnetism? This explains gravity, but there's one more thing to explain, right? There's magnetism. How do you explain magnets? This here is an original drawing by Descartes himself. This is twisted, okay? A here is your south pole, and this is your north pole. And here you have round lodestones, I, K, all of these are lodestones. So this is, I think, along the lines of what he would do if he had PowerPoint, if he had Photoshop and other things. So he would probably go for something like this. So this is your North Pole, this is your South Pole, okay? And a bunch of lodestones here. Now, according to Descartes, the Earth is fitted with parallel threaded pores. You see, these are pores that form long passages oriented north-south. They're very, very tiny pores, invisible to naked eye, but that's what we have. Descartes says, tiny helical, by helical he means corkscrew shape, these particles circulate from and to these threaded pores in two directions. Here, you see these are the particles? They go this way and then that way. Lodestones are also fitted with parallel threaded pores. That's what makes them lodestones. If we zoom in here, you see, these are your helical particles. An object that is magnetically neutral would have pores in all different directions. But the moment you have pores parallel to one another, then you get something that is no longer magnetically neutral. A magnet can affect that object. When reaching the lodestone, these particles cause it to turn in the direction so that threaded pores are aligned with the circulating streams. The moment these particles reach the lodestone, 
becomes aligned in the direction of the motion of these particles. So in this particular case would be north-south. And this explains the orientation of the compass towards north and south. And in general, these helical particles pass through the tiny pores of a lodestone or a piece of iron and thus cause magnetic effects. And this becomes very technical when he explains how is it possible for a magnet to attract another magnet or to repel another magnet. It gets very technical. He assumes the motion of two different types of corkscrew particles in two different directions. And then in some cases, some of the pores should be in such a way that they only accept particles moving in this direction and not the ones that are in this direction. Anyways, it gets very complex. But the basic idea, I think, is clear. So you have a space full of these spiral-like particles and they penetrate through everything that is not magnetically neutral and they create magnetic effects. So this is your Cartesian magnetism. Magnetism is a result of the circulation of tiny helical particles through parallel threaded pores and through space around magnets. This is your magnetism. I know we're getting a bit technical here, but the explanation and the presentation of a Cartesian worldview wouldn't be complete without this. Okay, if there are no questions, then we're going to move on to the hypothetical deductive method. You know a thing or two about this method already. It's the idea that a hypothesis that introduces unobservable entities is acceptable only if it provides confirmable predictions. And it's based on two principles, the principle of complexity and the principle of post hoc explanations by the third law. But this was only one aspect of the method of the time. I'm going to give you two more in contrast with the Aristotelian method. Let's start with the Aristotelian no experiments method. You remember this, we covered this last time. According to the Aristotelian scientists, if a theory about the nature of a thing relies in any way on experiments, it is unacceptable. The nature is to be studied in observations only. Why is that? Why would experiments be unnatural? Experiments are unnatural because that's what experiments are. They involve artificial setups. Experiments are unnatural, we understand that, and they are unnatural because there is a strict distinction between things natural and things artificial. This is the key belief that leads to this method. It's only when you believe that natural things is one thing and artificial things is another thing, it's only when you believe in this clear-cut distinction between the two that you exclude all the experimentation. And this is what the Aristotelians accepted. They believed in a clear-cut distinction between natural things and artificial things. In other words, between things with their inner source of change and things that have an external source of change that are created artificially. For Descartes, this distinction would make no sense whatsoever. Why? You understand the Cartesian worldview now. You have, let's say, an artificial thing and a natural thing. Why are they not different? And in what way they are not different for Descartes? Yep. All matter is just extension, so it should all be the same in principle. Exactly. All matter is just a combination of particles. Everything, artificial, natural, it doesn't matter. It doesn't make any difference whatsoever. They're subject to the same laws. The behavior is explained by the same set of laws, artificial, natural, just like we would have it nowadays. We don't distinguish between things natural and artificial. The motion of planets is explained by the same set of laws which we use to explain the motion of a clock. So by the theory rejection theorem, once Descartes' theory becomes accepted, this proposition has to go. And it is replaced by an idea that all things obey the same laws. There is no strict distinction between natural and artificial. Both natural and artificial things are essentially systems of moving particles. And there is no distinction between them. There's no qualitative distinction. Therefore, when studying the world, the artificial setup of experiments is not an obstacle and therefore you arrive at the experimental method. That it is okay to rely both on the results of observations and the results of experiments. This here, the acceptance of Cartesian worldview, it doesn't create experimentation and the whole idea of experiments, it was all over the place. But this one, this particular move, it legitimized experimentation. After that, it was okay to accept the results of experiments just as it was okay to accept the results of observations. You could no longer say, well, no, 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 you studied that bird in the cage, you cannot accept the results. You could no longer say that. The behavior in the cage would be as indicative as behavior outside of a cage because it is a behavior, it needs to be studied. It can tell you something about the bird. 
there is no limitation anymore. You can experiment as much as you want. Now, it is commonly believed, especially among philosophers, that Descartes didn't have anything to do with experimentation. It is true that he used pure intuition and deduction to arrive at the foundations of his system. He said, well, yes, when it comes to such principles as matter is extension and the existence of the human mind and the existence of God and all those sort of things, you don't need experiments to prove those things. But when it came to specific explanations of specific phenomena, let's say gravity or magnetism, he realized that there is not a single chance that you can deduce those explanations from your fundamental principles. So what do you do? You can no longer have absolute knowledge about those things because they're not deducible. The same gravity can be explained in 10,000 different ways. So he appreciated that this is where you have to hypothesize. This is where you have to suggest the hypothesis and test that hypothesis in experiments and observations. When it came to the nitty-gritty of things, to specific explanations of things, they realized that you cannot have intuitive truths. You must hypothesize and you must test your hypothesis experimentally. Yes, the fundamental principles is a different matter, but they're already established. You already have them. It's already been proven that your mind exists. It's already been proven that God exists, that the material world exists. But for everything else, for actual explanations, why is it that this particular clock works, or why is it that this particular animal reproduces, or anything really, you need to hypothesize. There is no other way. Make sense? Very good. Now let's move on to the next important ingredient of the Aristotelian method, which was the idea that if a theory about certain qualitative change employs some mathematics, it is unacceptable. This is a so-called non-mathematical method. This restriction was part of the Aristotelian medieval mosaic, and by the third law, it followed from the accepted theories of the time, in particular the idea that mathematics is inapplicable to instances of qualitative change. Why is that? Why did they believe that mathematics is not really applicable to such things as a metamorphosis of a caterpillar to a butterfly? Because he believes that uh, there is a strict distinction between qualitative phenomena and quantitative phenomena. Exactly. That's because they believed in a strict distinction between qualitative and quantitative. This is what they believed. They believed that there is a qualitative change, an acquisition of a new quality, and there is a change that concerns number, shape, size, quantitative change. And these are essentially different. If you are with Descartes, can you hold on to this view? Can you still accept it? Why yes or why not? I think because if matter is all made up of one thing, then there's, there's no duality between quality and quantity. Exactly. According to Descartes, this distinction makes no sense whatsoever. Descartes says, all instances of qualitative change in material things are essentially quantitative. And why is this? Because it's only extension. And everything that is extended is, by definition, subject of geometry, isn't it? These things here, just different combinations of material particles. Yes, very complex ones, and maybe such that we will never be able to know with utmost precision. And yet, essentially, what matters here is that these are only combinations of different particles. And as such, they are amenable to mathematical explanation. They are quantifiable because they're just extension. Thus, we arrive at this conclusion. Mathematics has a universal application. It is applicable to all types of change, including the so-called qualitative change. And in this world, you don't really have a purely qualitative change. Everything that appears to be an instance of an acquisition of new quality is essentially a movement and rearrangement of particles. And as such, it must be explicable mathematically. It might be very difficult. We grant that. And he understood it might be a task that maybe thousands of generations of human scientists wouldn't be able to accomplish. But it is, in principle, explicable mathematically. Therefore, Theories concerning qualitative changes are allowed to employ mathematical tools, just like any theories, really. Any theories are allowed to employ mathematical tools. Mathematics is no longer confined to the domain of quantitative change. It can be applied to all sorts of change. Let's sum it up. You have Aristotelian, you have Cartesian. So pluralism was the opposite here. 
dualism. Here, teleology, action by, action by contact. Here you have hylomorphism, the idea that everything is a combination of matter and form. And here you have mechanicism, that everything is just bits of interacting matter. Let's move on to the method. The Aristotelians had intuitive truth. Now you have hypothetical deductive method or novel predictions, essentially. Then, when they had no experiments, you have experiments and when they applied mathematics, but to a limited number of phenomena. And here you have a universal application of mathematics. So you see what Descartes did. He removed many of the boundaries. No experiments, no mathematics. And this essentially opened the doors to the science as we nowadays know it. So in terms of the method, hypothetical deductivism, experimental method, mathematical method, it's very similar to what we have nowadays. Very good. Next time, a Newtonian worldview. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>